Now, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time here talking about uh, uh, work that we've done with, uh, with some of these byproduct feeding programs. Uh, our, again, uh, our area, we, we, we generally are having people uh, going out and feeding calves that are either on pasture or on hay-based rations. Uh, we have some folks doing silage-based uh, uh, TMR approaches, as I, as I mentioned, where they're carrying a lot of the speed out. Uh, but those are relatively those are relatively rare in our area. We just don't grow as much corn silage as we once did. Now, something that I'm not going to talk about, but I'll just throw it out there, and I, I will uh, I will be around the rest of the day. Be glad to talk to you about it. But we've been doing a fair bit of work with sorghums uh, for silage as compared to corn silage, and these, some of these new forage sorghums are pretty phenomenal and very interesting. So. If you're, uh, if you're interested in that and grow corn silage, I'd be glad to talk to you a little bit about that uh, a little bit later on. Now, just to, just to give you an idea of some of the, uh, the basic type of work that we've done, this is a, a, a couple of years of data from our, our Upper Mountain Research Station that is, uh, it is, is in Laurel Springs up in the mountains of North Carolina. And what we've done there for a number of years is brought in calves, and these are, these are basically uh, stock market type calves. They come in as, as five weights, and, uh, and we put them through a program where we feed them hay, as well as some of the different byproducts. We've done lots of different combinations and, and comparisons over the years at that site. But what we typically do is we try to have a hay only group so that we see what the response is for our concentrates over if they were just fed hay. And then, uh, and then we do a variety of, uh, of different byproducts. So this particular study, we were comparing just straight soy hulls, uh, the corn gluten feed pellets that come out of, uh, out of Tennessee, and then the loose corn gluten feed that comes out of Winston Sand, North Carolina. And that's, you know, there's, those, are, those are also uh, available in this area in a similar format. Now, what we see typically is with that, this is about six pounds of feed per day, in addition to pre-choice hay. And we always get this somewhere around uh, three quarters to a pound a day bump above the hay only. And, and so part of the story here, it depends on how good your hay is. You start to realize that, that the hay quality makes a big difference. And I'm going to show you some other data that will continue to reinforce that. This particular couple of years, we had very good hay. And the calves on hay only ate almost a pound and a half a day, which is pretty darn, pretty darn good and, and favorable. But again, feeding of six pounds. Uh, got us up in the ballpark of two and a, two and a quarter with, with soy balls. One year, the pelleted uh, corn gluten feed looked a lot better than the, than the loose, that's the green bars. The second year, they were pretty much equivalent. So over the overall study, there really was no difference between those different corn gluten feed sources. Now, we've had some problems at times with corn gluten feed in terms of palatability. Kind of hard to understand that, but, uh, but um, this particular year, uh, two years, we had Some other work that we've done is based on stockpile fescue, and, and so we have lots of people down there now that are uh, that are starting to stockpile fescue and try to do a good job of grazing it in the winter time. And so this particular experiment was uh, was done to look at the level of, of concentrate that we feed to these calves. This is another real common question I get. You know, one percent of body weight, one and a half. What should be the, the feed level or delivery concentrate to these calves out of the pasture? So this was done at our Butner uh, Beef Cattle Field Lab in, in 2009 and 2010. Uh, we had the stockpile fescue was strip grazed from the middle of November until the middle of January. And we supplemented with either, uh, we either had straight, straight grass, no feed, or we had a half, one, or one and a half percent of, of body weight of that 50-50 uh, corn <coughs> feed soy home blend, which is kind of a common uh, become a common uh, commodity feed in our market down there. And uh, at the end, we, we synchronized these heifers and bred them. So this was kind of a dual purpose trial where we were very interested in helping stock people understand, you know, what's the most economical level to feed. But we were also interested in what we were doing with these heifers in terms of cyclicity and, and their, uh, their ability to breed when we started the, in, into an AI program. So uh, something here for both the stock folks and the cow calf people in the audience. Now, what we found was that we got around a, around a pound a day, about 1.2 in this particular uh, couple of years. We, on stockpile testing without supplement on, on, on growing calves, we get somewhere between about half a pound a day and about a pound and a half a day. And, and that one pound a day is a pretty, pretty good average to deal with. 
Uh, what, we, what we had in terms of our uh, half a percent of body weight, now that's about three, that's about three pounds. These are about six weight heifers going on. Uh, they gained about 1.6. When we gave them 1% of body weight, we were up a little bit above 2, and then up around 2.4 with our 1.5% uh, of body weight. So this is about what you would anticipate, and I guess nothing, uh, nothing really uh, earth-shattering here. This is, uh, this is something that folks have, have, have also uh, uh, thought a lot about, and they're trying to get that you know, generally above 2 pounds a day with these programs. Now, if we look at body condition score in these cattle, uh, the cattle that were on stockpile fescue only just sort of held their own. They gained a little bit in body condition over those two months. But once we got up here into one and a half percent, those cattle were getting pretty fat. And so they, they, uh, they started out about 5.3 on body condition score. So those were above six. And they're getting into where they're a little bit fleshy for the, for the, uh, for the stocker market. And so that's something that we have to watch when we, uh, when we, when we do these, these programs where we're pushing feed pretty hard. Now, if we look at, at uh, our return uh, and, and our economics of this, it tailed off uh, at the high level with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the 1% being about the same in terms of return per head as the 1.5%. And, and that's because we were putting, you know, putting more expensive fee in there into those calves to get that gain. Now, the... Uh, the interesting thing to me is that if we look at this in terms of the return to the land, so in terms of how many uh, you know, dollars we were returning per acre, then it continues to go up. And that's because we were able to stock more cattle at this 1.5% body weight than we were at 1%. Essentially, uh, they started to get a decrease in forage intake at 1.5% of body weight, and so they needed less pasture. So we actually could stock up more cattle per acre, and therefore that return uh, really favored the high level of feeding where we were, you know, where we had that option. So again, I, I, I'm, th this is really what's driving these folks that are stopping calves up four or five per acre, carrying all their feed, letting them get the good grass that they can, and then, uh, and then being able to get large returns per acre. Just a little, just to give you a little bit on the, on the repro uh, part of this, uh, not to get completely off topic, but basically these calves, they started around six weights. Uh, by the end of the, of the grazing period, they were up uh, uh, around 660 on the, on the unsupplemented, up to about 740 on those that got the high level of supplement. And if you think about, uh, again, developing heifers, we're trying to get those to be about, you know, to traditionally about two thirds of their mature body weight. Uh, with, uh, with these heifers and with current programs, we're really not pushing heifers as hard as we used to. And uh, these are only going to be raised from about 51 to about 56% of their mature body weight at the time that we start uh, the breeding season. And uh, so what we found in this particular uh, set of data, this yellow is the, our AI freight rate uh, to, to timed AI. And so you see that we got a pretty big bump uh, both at the half and the 1% of body weight. Uh, feeding feeding level, we were about 30, 50, and then we got up to about 65% when we got to that 1% of body weight. Uh, no additional benefit with the one and a half, and that's maybe what we would expect. Overall breeding rate, we were up around 80 with the zero supplementation, and then we were up above 90 with the other three levels. So, uh, so as, as folks kind of think about how are you going to prime these heifers getting ready for breeding, if that's what your goal is uh, with your growing program, uh, if you're really intent on getting high AI success, you might want to go to the 1%, uh, but it looks like a half a percent will get you pretty good reproductive performance and, uh, and, and get, get that far done. Uh, so uh, that, that's been quite useful in terms of helping make recommendations to folks that, uh, that are trying to get, these, uh, get into these synchronized programs.